Hello and welcome to the first module of the uh, HMCT Design Educators Typography Intensive. Um, it is um, teaching typographic identities with Simon Johnston and uh, Tyrone Drake. Um, I'm Gloria Kondrup. If you weren't at the first uh, keynote, I'm the executive director of the Hoffman Smoken Center for Typography. Um, and it's our mantra that effective teaching should be shared, not a secret. Um, I want to again thank Google for their uh, generous sponsorship and also support from Art Center College of Design and the Lowell Milken Family Foundation. Um, your moderator, Ty Drake, um, has uh, successfully collaborated on graphic design, branding and visual communications related, related products with many high profile clients. I'm not gonna mention them, Ringo Starr, <clears throat> in the field of architecture, music, film, sports, health, luxury and beauty. Um, he has 16 years as a design educator. I have to say, I teach with both of these gentlemen. I've been teaching with them for, um, I hate to say how long guys, 20 some odd years now. And, you and, you're still and you're still standing. And I'm still standing and you're still yes. standing. Yes. Um, and Ty actually now his work is in the collection of LACMA. Mm, very impressive Ty. Uh, he will be leading the conversation with Simon Johnston. Uh, Professor Simon Johnston, of course, is the Director of Typography at the uh, Graphic Design Department at Art Center, both graduate and undergraduate. Both gentlemen teach in both graduate and undergraduate, uh, mm -hmm. supervising the typography curriculum here at Art Center College of Design. Um, he is also the Creative Director of the Hoffman Milken Center of Typography. Um, we, if you haven't noticed, you'll hear you were born in England. You studied with uh, Wolfgang Weingart at the, please help me, Kunstgewerbe Schule. Kunstgewerbe Schule. Thank you, in Basel, oh. where Leah Hoffmitz also studied. That's also our Armin Hoffman, wonderful. Have to say. Right, Armin Hoffman. You sound um, he, um, you were the instigator and co-editor of the typography journal Octavo, I believe. That's mm -hmm. right, Simon. Um, he does book design, his own writing, his own art. And you just completed your um, sixth volume of the John Baldessari Catalog Resonne. Very impressive. I'm Not putting a, a pitch in for that. I believe it's been uh, published already, isn't it? Yep, yep, all six. It's available. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Ty and Simon. I will disappear just in case you need me. I'll be on mute, I'll be listening and I'll stop my video. So Ty, and Simon, thank you both so much for being here and um, start teaching. Thank you. Thank Gloria. you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's uh, my absolute pleasure to um, kind of introduce you guys, uh, Simon Johnston, uh, who um, is one of our most respected uh, type teachers at Art Center. Um, uh, I, I was a student of Simon's when I, in my undergraduate studies at Art Center. Um, and one of the things that I respected most about Simon is the fact that the way, his, the way he taught the class, uh, he gave, he didn't dictate um, his methodology uh, and approach to teaching necessarily. Um, he gave us space to actually take in the learning um, and the, the process that he was teaching um, and allow that to, allow allow that to sort of become part of the results that he would get out of the classroom and again you know myself being someone who was kind of you know uh rebellious anyway uh simon was one of the few teachers i had at art center who i felt gave me the space to to explore and to uh discover uh the outcomes of of the classes that i was that, that were being taught uh, one of the things that you'll see in the work that he's going to show today, and the things that I really respect about Simon is his attention to detail. Um, and uh, he still teaches in points and pikas, which is cool, um, obviously. Uh, and, and this attention to detail, you, I guess that's probably this emphasis of, of studying in Europe um, and then also uh, being uh, studying under Wolfgang Weingart uh, and, and results of 
of that whole European sort of educational and pedagogy and methodology. Uh, and you'll see that again in, in, in a lot of the work that he's going to show. I'm always uh, somewhat uh, fascinated by the work that comes out of the classes uh, that Simon teaches. The classes that I teach, we, I put more emphasis on typographic voice and narrative. Uh, and, and when I see the work that comes out of Simon's class and especially the attention to detail and the system based um, work that comes out of that class, I'm always amazed. So anyway, let me turn it over to Simon uh, and hopefully you guys, we see some really beautiful work. And uh, at the end of his presentation, I'm gonna be asking a series of questions uh, and you guys could also in your Q and A ask, uh, ask some questions as well, which I'll pick from uh, when, this, when Simon's presentation is over. And then hopefully you guys will join us for the breakout session later. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Simon Johnston. Take it away, Simon. Thank you so much, Ty. I'm glad the, the uh, mental scars from being in my class haven't uh, lasted <laughs> too long. So I'm gonna share the screen here and see if we can get the technology going. So uh, teaching typographic identities. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, wherever you are. Let's see, uh, originally you might've seen a, t a title for this uh, lecture called something to do with uh, teaching brand brand identities, uh, I th uh, brand identity basics, I think it was. That wasn't, to be honest, my title. Um, I, ha I have a bit of a problem with the word brand sometimes, which I need to talk about just a little bit first. It's sometimes a very broad term. Um, it can lead to confusion. I think people sometimes use the word brand when they actually mean the identity. Different ways of thinking about this. I like to talk to students about the idea of, well, we've all heard the phrase corporate identity. Um, but not everything is a corporation, but there are places that do need identities. So the useful thing about the word corporate in that sense uh, is the origin of the word corporate comes from the Latin root uh, corpus, meaning body. So I think one way of thinking about uh, identities is if, if, if the brand, let's say, is the body, then the identity is the face, uh, the, the, the form, the signal, the visual signal by which we recognize that, that greater body. Another way of thinking about um, the identity in relation to brand, I think, is also the iceberg analogy, which, which I've heard used, uh, that the, the, uh, the visible part of the, of the iceberg being the identity that you see, the, the, the brand itself being a much larger uh, entity. Um, so I, I've, I've roughly broken my uh, talk into three sections. Uh, the first section uh, is going to be about identity design assignments that I've given to students within a typography class, not a brand identity class. The reason I do this, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of students, when they start working with typography, they tend to think of it as a support mechanism to images, and they don't really think about it as being capable of being an image in itself. And I think it's important that um, students are given projects where they can look at typography being capable of being a thing in itself, enough on its own, as it were. So um, there's a few assignments here. I'll just rattle through some of them. Um, this first one, a couple of examples where they were tasked with designing a, a visual identity for an exhibition, which then had to appear on a poster and um, a book cover. In this case, just three, three places, not really a full identity program as it were, but um, it's still, you know, is this a brand? I would say no, it's a visual identity for an exhibition. In this case, the student chose the artist Donald Judd and I think what's interesting here is you could look at this and think, well, it's, it's, you know, it's just some typesetting, which it is, but it's way more sophisticated than that because um, one of the things that's going on, if we start to look at the, the internal rhymes, shall we say, of, of the forms we're seeing, and all the time relating it to Judd's work, I would say, we're, we're seeing six circular white counters. We're seeing six vertical strokes in the Ds, the L, and, and also the J. Uh, we're seeing four Ds, so there's some internal repetition going on there. And we're seeing, unusually, uh, flush right, um, the alignment on the right-hand side, the Ds face the left. This gives the opportunity of the two Ds repeating themselves down on the, that, that sort of unit on the uh, lower right there. So this comes about through exercises that I give the students to do to make sure when they're working with received language, let's say, that they're studying and analyzing what's in the given forms, what, what's, what's happening in uppercase, what's happening in lowercase, what's happening with serifs, what happens with uh, sans serif. So I, in this class and others, I make them do sort of formal analysis without choosing favorite fonts, it's not about that. It's just seeing what's in the letter forms that, you've, that you're working with. 
So I think, um, and I'll just click through some, some poster treatments here. Um, obviously with that flushed right alignment, then the J becomes a vertical alignment possibility um, through these posters. So once the identity is resolved, it's then applied to two or three um, different situations. Um, that red type should probably align with the left edge of that Judd sculpture, but anyway, we'll move on. The, um, the thing I like about this is that uh, in its geometry, its sense of repetition, its sense of minimalism, it relates very well to Judd's own work. And so that's, that's what we're always trying to do. We're trying to find a typographic voice that links or connects to whatever the subject matter might be. You can think of it as the rhetoric of form um, in terms of how, how the shapes of the letters, how the groupings of the letters connect us to a, a thought or a feeling or a subject matter. And um, she also did a book cover, which I like very much because we're now starting to get into more repetition, the pattern uh, that's starting to be created. I like also the way it connects to forms that we might be familiar with from concrete poetry in the 1960s, uh, um, which we see kind of referenced here, shall we say, uh, which is a good connection in terms of time period. So uh, I just want to reiterate that sense of type typesetting studies being an important starting point. I'll, talk, I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Um, another similar student project for a particular exhibition, uh, a typographic identity for an exhibition. Again, is this a brand? Not really. It's a, it's, a, it's a typographic identity for an event, which can then be used in different, different instances. I'm not sure if you're familiar with David Shrigley's work. It's, it's mad, it's entertaining, it's, it's funny, it's irreverent. Um, the title, Lose Your Mind, just going through that one move being inverted like that, I think is a nice simple gesture that references work. Here you can see one of his uh, sculptures, if we can call it, I think we call it that, a stuffed cat with a sign saying I'm dead. We see the identity, the typographic identity used here, but we also start to see how it then gets employed down below for secondary information. So the same internal logic, let's call it, is used for the material um, down, down below. Um, and then onto a book cover as well. Uh, in this case, the students did do the interior of the book. That's a separate issue. I'm not going to get into that here. Next up, I want to talk about some uh, projects that uh, are kind of a standard project that I do with my type three students. So remember, these are these are third term students. Um, and again, this is the first project. It's a quick four week project that I give them to introduce them to this idea of type as image and also as identity so that they're exploring the ideas of uh, how to create an identity just using type. In this case, for a typographic event, it's a, it's a little bit uh, self-indexing, uh, obviously a little bit meta in some ways, but uh, the idea is that um, it's for a contemporary typographic conference. So they are the audience, we are the audience. Uh, it, has to, it has to have a certain knowledge of typography or at least be uh, approachable and interesting for, for, for students that are and, and professionals that are working in the, in the area. So for example, here we have just this move at the top in, in, the, in the mark, which is a, a band that goes through the, the type setting. The letters reverse to white through that band, but the descenders then are still held there. So it's a negative inversion uh, that we see in the mark for type Oslo, but it's not just in the mark. See what happens with a move like that is it's capable then of becoming a typographic system. So in this case, what happens is that it's not just a mark, the mark is capable of extending its, its um, aesthetic, shall we say, through other typographic materials. So obviously it works at a larger scale, so this could be used for signage, and in this case used for large posters. I should point out as well, and you'll see some pictures in a minute, these uh, designs, are, these posters are actually six feet by three feet, um, so they're, they're, they're tall, they're human scale, and I, we do them in Paz and Neg, which you'll see uh, in some shots in a second as well, because we can then wallpaper the, the well, we used to be able to before, before uh, coronavirus, we used to be able to sort of wallpaper the classroom with them. Um, and I'll tell you why uh, in a second. Obviously, uh, another one here, the main identity you see at the lower left, um, this was all done in OCRA, I believe, but the student had used the zero character rather than the O character, unless that is the O character. Anyway, she switched them around. But we see four of them down below in that four by three structure. And then as a graphic extension of that, played with overlaying some of the characters um, to get a sense of, how should we call it, system aesthetics, coding even, uh, scrambled language. So we start to look at the abstract shapes of forms a lot more. But as a kind of extension of the graphic uh, language, I think it's uh, very successful. 
Um, here's another logo for the word Oslo. Uh, it's unusually, you know, it's, it's stacked vertically. Uh, it's got a curious S with a diagonal, which is mimicked uh, in the L as well. It's an outline, it overprints, but essentially the outline vertical logo plus the overprinting became the core ad identity kind of moves in this one. I think what's interesting to talk to the students about is not just the mark itself, but also the potential for the mark to become then a signal or a, a kind of a, uh, a system or a typographic structure that can be mimicked or echoed or, or followed on elsewhere. So here's a really nice example. This is in fact an illustration student. Uh, it's always interesting what solutions they come up with sometimes. Look at that sexy S in Oslo. But what's also interesting is the is the the solid circle, the solid squares, rather the, the black squares used for the O's um, that then are repeated in uh, people's names, which we see in, in, in close up here. So although the logo the identity, the word mark, whatever you want to call it, is a fixed form in itself and can operate on its own. It's also then, by extension, becoming part of the secondary language. In this case, a sort of sliced through logo we're seeing at the top, uh, then repeated uh, on the poster, it has flow and motion and movement, obviously. In the words Oslo and typo, um, you know, there are three O's, so those are opportunities uh, for students to play. Here again, thinking about structures and systems, the actual T21 uh, mark at the top is fairly minimal, shall we say, but the student's been using a notion of, I think he described it as kind of ticker tape or the flow of language that you get at, at the bottom of, you know, sports results or news uh, data flowing across the bottom of the screen. So that was his kind of internal logic, um, which can then flow through and be used in different places. So all the time, although we're trying to develop an individual mark, I'm also asking them to come up with gestures that can be used and implemented elsewhere. Here again, the core logo we see in the middle with three vertical O's, the, type, the, the O from Oz, uh, typo, and then the two O's from Oslo all aligned become, uh, that becomes almost like a spine of the mark itself. And then repetition then becomes part of the secondary uh, graphic language. Here we see there's a few kind of uh, in context uh, shots here I have for you, just to give a sense of installation, but also to remind you and for you to be able to see that I asked them to put the, the marks on uh, T-shirts and bags and badges. It's not an extensive uh, identity program, but it's enough to give them a sense of, shall we say, ownership of the mark you know, the marks have to be good enough that, that they want to wear them in class in a, in, a, in a t shirt. They have to be interesting enough and fresh enough to appeal to one another as type fans and, and um, they have to feel contemporary enough to, to be able to operate in, the, in that area. So we get some interesting results in, on the walls. I think what's important about the fact that these are six by three feet is the sense of scale. They become larger than the students, uh, they cover the whole room. Why is this important? Obviously we can't do this on Zoom right now, but why is it important? Because I think it's important that any identity be perceived ultimately as having to operate on a public scale. Uh, and public scale means, you know, at a large scale, it becomes, I would say the difference between public communication and private communication is an important one to think about sometimes. When I'm looking at a book, it's, you know, two, two feet away. That's, that's what I would call private communication. It's for one person's eyes. When we're dealing with identities, they're out there in the public. Uh, it has to be, we have to be thinking about public communication, which means we have to be thinking about visibility of forms from, you know, 200 yards across the room, whatever it might be. So they have to have a certain weight and obviously iconic interest as, uh, as, as happens in, in, in posters uh, anyway, but they have to be able to draw your attention in and work from a distance. So scale uh, is an important part of this process of getting that understanding of, of public communication. I'm a bit worried about that student on the left there. I'm not sure if they're fainted out of exhaustion or maybe he's taking a photograph. Notes relating to uh, that project, just an overview of really what the, the shorter form identity project uh, involves. Second section I'm talking about, these are all projects that have occurred in my identity systems class. It's called communication design four in a sequence of classes uh, called communication design uh, and it's called identity systems. Specifically, it's not called branding again, because I find that too vague, uh, but the word systems uh, is important uh, in that title and relates to the idea that students need to be thinking about how 
something ultimately is not just going to be a logo it's going to be part of a broader graphic vocabulary and ultimately that does become a, a system we'll talk a little bit more about that um, typically i give choices in the class uh, i give normally three uh, choices one typically one cultural one commercial um, and one more of event an event or a conference or something like that because i it, it tends to give them lots of different opportunities some people want to you know, are more technically, technically minded. Some people want to experiment a lot more. So the choices mean that we always get interesting results. And I think the classes, uh, all students benefit from seeing other, other assignments going on and being developed at the same time. I thought it might be useful just to, to follow some early sketches of uh, one particular project, if only because we can see the germ of the idea taking place. Uh, this is one of three directions, I would say. At this point, they haven't been edited out. I asked them all to do three directions that they equally sort of believe in or have, have interest in. So in this case, and forgive me, I'm not gonna be using student names because uh, sometimes it just gets in the way, but uh, the, the interesting idea here that was starting to take place, which if you can see my cursor, was up in this, this area of the two eyes, uh, the, sorry, the dots over the eye and the J of Fuji becoming kind of shifted across and getting this sort of optical black white thing going on. So this was one direction preceding this, I should point out, were the a lot of typeface studies done with, you know, with, let's say, a neutral typeface study, just to learn about the forms. Um, as we discussed with the Donald Judd, you know, some characters point to the left, some characters face to the right, some characters are symmetrical through their center axis. In some fonts, certain letter forms are curved, in others, they're, they're more square. All of these things can sometimes give opportunities, can provide uh, catalysts, I would say, for design directions. So in this case, the germ of the idea was this shifting of, of seeing in lowercase that there happened to be two dots there in the word Fuji. We had originally reduced this word down from Fuji film just because I wanted to lose the word film because they're involved in digital so much that it always seems curious to me to have the word film in there. Anyway, I digress. But so preceding this were a lot of typeface studies. This is one direction. She and I were both interested in this idea of, of the junction of, the, of this sort of optical quality that was going on here. This was also interesting down here where it carried on through the, through the U and the F, not really the F here, but the U carried on that feeling. And that was starting to be kind of intriguing. What wasn't working in that one, which we see also, um, if I go back, I can, yeah, what wasn't really working here was the width of the U, the fact that we had three different black shapes on the top, top of the F looks too long. So this kind of ongoing refinement and refinement, she ended up, in talking about it, we ended up looking at how these two were working here and thinking, well, the F feels heavy here, why can she use the top of this F here with that white square? pulled out rather like these white squares are pulled out. And ultimately that seemed to have a, a, quite a lot of potential uh, in the sense that it had a sort of band across the top. And you can see in this early version, you know, the baseline isn't consistent. Uh, she has actually condensed the U to make it narrower. So that the black square at the top here is the same as these other two black squares. So that was starting to get somewhere but still needed further refinement. Uh, here, now we're getting a consistent baseline, and I think the form itself is, is, is pretty nicely resolved, and I want to talk just for a second about how, you know, in terms of analyzing the form, I think it's clearly legible as Fuji, that's not an issue, but I think the, the, the sort of graphic gesture, if we can call it that, that goes across the top of this form has multiple reads, and I think it's always important that the students start to think about the potential of a form having many different reads. So. You know, from this, uh, we can get the idea of pixels, clearly, we can get the idea of bits, it has a kind of binary, black, white computing kind of sensibility um, to it as well. I'm also getting a sense of film strip, going back to the, the history in, in, in film, I'm getting the idea of pause and neg happen, again, to do with film and, and inversion. I get the idea of production flow from this kind of sequence going along on the top, it's kind of manufacturing and, and units and so forth. Um, and I'm also getting a, a kind of an optical quality going on, that, that sense of flashing and, and kind of reverberation that's happening in the, at the top junction of those two elements. Has an optical activity, it's about the act of seeing, that's part of what's you know, in this as a mark. And Fuji, as you know, don't just do 
consumer materials, they do um, medical imaging systems and so forth. So I just wanted to look at one in terms of detail, the internal structure, the bar on the left at the top of the F is two times the length of the, the other uh, elements on top. Uh, I'm gonna jump through some of these next ones because we've talked about this one enough, but I wanted to talk as well about how the mark itself then becomes the catalyst for a secondary range of graphic elements. So it's not just about the mark. Evaluating how the mark is working is also thinking about ahead. Can it be the source of other secondary secondary moves? So we see that happening uh, here, uh, the kind of checkerboard thing on the back of stationery. And then in some posters, the way that kind of graphic language allows a certain degree of flexibility to be able to be integrated with, with imagery and you know, clearly work with photography. But um, you know, when we're seeing it small on the poster here, and it's important that the mark resolves itself and works when it's small, lower left of the poster here, I think that reads very well easily, but it's still very, very strong down there. A few notes uh, relating to that. The key points may be resolve the form in black and white first. That's super important, unless of course your concept involves color, unless it's something to do with, you know, what um, spectrums or uh, kaleidoscopes or something, but it's important to resolve the first, uh, resolve the form in color. One other thing that I talk to students about, and it sounds a little bit strange, but in terms of progressing and finding the best version uh, of resolving the form is to imagine that the best version of your concept already exists and it's your job to find it by which I mean you need to try all the variables, slightly thicker, slightly thinner, what's wider, which is this font, is this font the correct font for this issue, for this uh, project and so forth. So that we are quite logically going through all of the variables. And then what happens when you do that is the, the best one clearly uh, stands out. Uh, I'll keep going. A few other ones, uh, I'll just go through the sort of key things that I find of interest about some of these. This one for General Electric, I liked the sense with which the center of the mark was almost the letter forms were flowing out of the center, almost like a manufacturing process or paper coming off a press. Um, it has a, a nice kind of energy uh, flow, which obviously for GE uh, works. Here we're also seeing, we can talk a little bit about the, the sequence of decision-making. Here we're seeing secondary typography saying general electric, aviation, whatever it is. That obviously is, that decision comes after. The mark has to be resolved first, and then the secondary typography has to react to the mark. Next up, uh, a rather nice one identity for the Artificial Intelligence Association. What I love about this is the fact that the students saw an I inside the A, but only with this type of letter form, with this sort of squared up kind of boxy, blocky letter form that in fact they drew themselves. But this observation came out of the earlier typeface, sort of neutral, shall we call it, typeface studies. What I like about this is for me, it's, it's almost like I'm seeing intelligence itself. Uh, the fact that the I exists within the A uh, is a form of intelligence. Um, it's, it's, it's quite binary, but I think what's important is that I think we can sense the intelligence within the mark. It's an optical quality, it's a formally resolved mark, but I encourage students, I, you know, I, I want to see intelligence in the mark. I don't just want to see a good looking mark. Um, you know, I'm, I'm greedy. I want beauty and intelligence to be evident. Uh, in, in the work. Uh, and there's no reason why, why both can't be achieved. In some, in some ways, I think we don't talk enough about intelligence being visible in, in design, but that's a, that's a separate issue for a separate uh, occasion, I'm sure. Um, I encourage the students to experiment with different applications. Uh, so here's uh, this, this student, you know, built a little matrix with, with, with lights in there. I, I enjoy it as an experiment. Um, I'm not sure whether the dot structure works. Uh, in addition to this graphic language, but maybe it does. I think the, the modularity of it can hold up. Um, experimentation is important once they have the form resolved. You know, with the form resolved, I then want them to run with it and see what it can do. Next up, this was a, uh, a really interesting project for an experimental theater uh, company, ETC. And obviously the student has run with the idea of et cetera and the repetition um, of the idea. It's, she's done it in a very kind of performative way, which makes sense for theater. I should also point out that I think in a lot of cases, uh, we have to be careful, or at least I'm very careful, I guess over time, of determining what kind of assignments to give and recognizing that certain assignments are gonna have a lot more possibility for students to have fun and play uh, than others. 
And so uh, this was one of those cases. I mean, I gave her that name, uh, Experimental Theatre Company, because I knew, et cetera, was something that you could do something really interesting with. And I think she really did. A couple more, a couple more, more examples, Canon. Um, you know, this is just really about how a simple gesture can sometimes be enough. The interior counter of the O moved up above. Uh, it becomes a dot, a button, something you press, the shutter on a, on a camera, perhaps. It becomes an eye, a lens. It's got multiple reads. It's not complex, um, but it really just functions uh, pretty well. I, I try and let the students also not be afraid of simplicity when it comes to a mark, because a mark has to function in very busy graphic environments a lot of the time. And one of the things we do, which I'm, I'm not able to show you in today's, oops, I'll go back, which one of the things I'm able to, um, we do in class is to take three, three directions and then test them out in photography to see how they each work in different situations. So what happens in the process is some of the marks will stand out and still be legible and others will disappear and uh, evaporate. Um, and that's often a good test of whether a mark is starting to work, whether it holds up in those situations. And sometimes it's the simpler ones that survive because they're more robust and can take busy graphic environments. So don't be afraid of simplicity in that sense. It's sometimes way more flexible with what you can do. I couldn't resist <laughs> dropping this one in for our, um, for our sponsor and, and friends at Google. I did set uh, Google as an assignment. This was a few years back, but I think it was a successful solution. Obviously, it, it, it focuses on the uh, maybe the search function of the, of the company, which is much obviously larger than that, but um, at least its original function, shall we say. A couple of nice posters to go with it. Or one in this case. This is a lovely solution for a language and technology conference. Again, very, very simple, but I would say very sophisticated. Just the L and the T overlapping. The point at which those two fields overlap is the is the subject, shall we say, of this this conference, um, which typically takes place in Poznan, I believe, in Poland. Um, but that gesture of the two meeting and the overlapping, then the overlapping becomes a secondary graphic language that we see happening just in the image on the right. That little color bar, color bar and, and the shift, the degree of overlap is then carried on as part of the graphic system. Um, another couple of posters to do with that. Again, going back to typeface studies, this student's project for the London uh, Olympics couldn't have happened, let's say, unless she'd noticed that it's possible to make an N with a, with a curved uh, top form, and hence the O, then the N, and then the D, create the, the, the first three arcs of the Olympic uh, mark. So again, this goes back to those early typeface studies. Um, and as I said before, those can be the catalyst of many, many ideas. I'm just flicking through this to show how it appears in a few situations. It worked nicely just as a reversed out, simple form. This particular student also did a fabulous set of icons, uh, human forms, just from simple icon, iconographic curves and lines. A museum of fashion, um, simple verticals and horizontals. A again, uh, reads well, is very clear was intended really to use, be used with photography because of how much fashion uh, photography uh, or, or much, how much photography is part of fashion. But it's also provided a secondary graphic language as we see uh, in these instances, um, simple repetitions of that vertical motif. In this case, for a, a Rio Olympics in 2016, the reason I'm showing this, not only is it a you know, great piece of work, but it enables us to talk about the idea of a uh, what you might call a short form and a long form version of a mark, or in this case, uh, a smaller scale one that gets used and also a larger scale one. So the mark itself is just the word Rio, um, but it has uh, you know, an alternate version um, of those multiple linear kind of outline version that we're seeing on these posters. You know, again, I go back to the issue of the form of the, of the mark itself at, at its simplest in black and white, must read well. So lower left there, I think that's reading very well on, on these posters. But it's nice to have that sort of amplified version of the mark to be able to play with, to run photography through, in this case, color gradations as well. Beautifully resolved, I think. Notes that relate to that last section. One of the main key points to, to, to think about is this idea of the, the form. Let's, say, let's call it the rhetoric of the form, um, the mark itself, the identity a way of thinking of it as almost compressed meaning. It needs to operate, there needs to be a shortcut to understanding, it has to be able to exist on its own, it has to be able to have its own power, by which I mean you can place it on a wall 
and it immediately brands the wall. It takes over that space. It owns that space because it has that degree of visual power. That's what we're looking for. Uh, it's not easy to achieve, but formal refinement uh, is where the, uh, the secret lies. Um, as uh, Ty alluded to earlier, basically, you know, form is paramount. No amount of, no amount of marketing bullshit will save a form that isn't resolved. So um, something to take, take with us. This third and last section deals with, let me remind myself, I've forgotten already. Okay, extending typographic brand identity systems, the idea of guidelines, um, standards manuals, if you like, and the idea of design by remote control. So I think it's fine for an initial project, those early four, five week projects that I showed you first, it's fine that they're not thinking in terms of how does a, how does a system get used. Uh, it's enough to just get their toes wet in the water of, of dealing with a typographic identity and thinking of type as image. But ultimately, as we know, the, the, the kind of the professional reality of identity systems is that they're used um, by many people, not by the designers who design them either. They get used by in-house design teams, by other you know, ad agencies, other design groups. And so part of the, the student's understanding of an identity system is that it needs to be capable of being, let's say, handed over. Um, once it's resolved as a vocabulary, uh, as a set of related graphic forms, then it becomes a toolkit, if you like, and that toolkit then gets passed on to the in-house design team or the institution itself or other the design groups that might be working with it. So an important part of the understanding of how an identity operates is how you control its use. How do you determine rules of engagement? So I have three kind of identity manuals here. They, they work in different ways. I'll go through them relatively quickly, but there are essentially three, three projects. This first one uh, for the Alberta Ballet Company, uh, you'll see an abstract logo there. That's essentially, that's, that's an A, this is a B, two of the forms, and this is a C. The form came through, um, looking at photographs of um, human, human form, human motion, of the way the arc of, of the arms moved when the body moves and rotates around. So the geometry and the form uh, is essentially derived from um, the movement of the, of the human body. I love its abstraction. I love its simplicity. Um, I think the fact that it, it can be read as an ABC, as, a, as an abstract mark is, is great, but then that also, is setting up a secondary graphic language. Um, here we see as well uh, the secondary typography adjacent to it. Obviously the form itself was, was resolved and then the Alberta Ballet Company typography was, was uh, placed uh, next to it with many different typographic studies to find the right one. I like the fact that this has a sort of quirky serif kind of quality to it. I think it's a good contrast to the geometry of the, of the mark itself. And I think I can mention just a little bit there. Uh, one thing I talk to the students about is that in design, we're, we're, we're always putting two things together, whether it's image and type, whether it's logo and word mark, uh, typography and mark as in, in this case. So in that process of putting two things together, it's almost like you reach a fork in the road. You can either go down what I call consonance or dissonance. That is harmony through similarity of form or harmony through use of contrast. So harmony of, through similarity of form um, would be to use, let's say a geometric typeface in this case. So the geometry of the, of the letter forms related to the geometry of the mark. Now that's understandable. That's kind of an obvious thought, um, but it is uh, in the words of one client I had once, uh, she was referring to clothes, but it's matchy matchy. And it can lead to, if you've got geometry in one form and geometry in the other, it can lead to a kind of flatness. Um, so in this case, the detail of the serif against the, the, the simplicity of the geometry, what, what works through the dissonance of those two, the successful harmonization of the contrast, is the fact that they both act as a foil for one another. They're doing different work, um, but they're complementing one another. They're, they're, they're a foil for each other. And so, I mean, that's something I drill into students, this idea of we're always putting two things together. You're always going to have to make that decision. Do I harmonize through similarity or do I harmonize through contrast? It's more sophisticated, I would say, for a designer to understand how to create harmonies through dissonance. It's harder to do, uh, but ultimately uh, there are many more places where it's useful. Um, I'm gonna flick through this just because this is the guidelines book. And as you see, you know, what not to do in places, 
colors, the typeface, that was called Circa Light. Um, here's where I wanted to get to this notion of the brand elements coming from the mark, but it sets up a kind of secondary graphic vocabulary, which we then see played out uh, very successfully in, in posters. We get a tracery of that geometric um, linear form, and obviously sometimes the solid form of the mark becomes part of that. Quarter circles, half circles are implemented in different ways. This was beautifully handled. The secondary typographic palette, just for two color things. One color treatments, how it combines with photography. So the linear tracery can become shape as well, so that you know it can, can be a container for, uh, for photography and image. And I'll just flick through the rest because you know what you're looking at. Um, the two elements can be disassociated, in this case, on the outside of a building. And then the forms, again, used in abstraction, in this case, three-dimensional um, uh, sort of relief treatments on walls. And on that staircase, linear treatments. Look at that, that's a, that's a dedicated student. She's managed to find a building with semicircular windows. Crazy attention to detail, but fabulous at the same time. Okay, one, a couple of quick last ones. This next one is for A10 networks. Um, very nice, fresh solution, simple blocky form. Here we see the, uh, how should we say, sad, um, regrettable uh, original marks there. This was an early version of the uh, identity guidelines, so uh, the page numbers weren't fleshed out. But the mark itself is based on a, uh, a four by four grid. This is a sort of data security, network security company. And so it has a strong kind of blocky quality. We see the construction of it there. We see the text secondary um, typeface uh, adjacent to it. The form has an internal counter in that constructed A, uh, which feels like it's being sort of safely protected. So I think in terms of the rhetoric of form, I think we can see that suggests the idea of security. But then we also see it in the secondary graphic palettes that were generated to go along with it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I do want to just touch on this idea of how the mark itself obviously reads well as an A, um, but then it, it has this capability of becoming a secondary form. So when it's stacked, it almost becomes like bricks. So the secondary graphic, this is derived from the logo, obviously with the counter taken out, but it's then giving us this modular kind of quality, which then pertains to the idea of screening or you know, walls or security. And so as a secondary graphic, the, and there we see it almost like Lego bricks, um, I'm also reading into it the idea of, you know, those crenellated walls you see on me medieval castles. So the visual language is of safety and security. Here we see the full identity kind of fleshed out um, in the sense that we see the mark reading very clearly lower left. We see the secondary typography. We see some of those patent forms, those um, screen forms, shall we say, and then it's integrated with, with photography. We always use posters as a way, even if you're only looking at three here, we always use posters within the class as an opportunity to explore the visual language involving photography and language and secondary typefaces. Obviously other elements that go with this, the students also then sometimes can explore generative um, options. I know we have one module that's gonna be focusing on that, but uh, the student did a great job putting together a kind of a sculptural form, sculptural version of the logo. That's sometimes a good filter to, to judge a logo a judge a word mark, is it capable of translation into three dimensions or animation, um, whatever. Um, the last example I'm gonna show you kind of for fun, the student had a, had a great time working with the theater of the absurd, um, which was, um, as you probably know, Eugene and UNESCO's kind of notion of theatrical performance. So um, we came up with an absurd theater. The logo is very, very simple, just the, the URD of the word absurd is inverted and then uh, often repeated. Um, he had a lot of fun putting this thing together. It's, it is an identity guidelines block, book, but not in the normal sense. It does contain what you should do and what you shouldn't do with the components. But at the same time, it becomes a place of adventure and experimentation uh, with the forms just to see. He, he put it into a lot of um, fabulous kind of vintage photography. And it shows the absurdity. There's a lovely kind of sense of, of, of play uh, with this. So it's, it's a non-typical approach to the guidelines book, but I think it shows how the guidelines book needn't be dry and um, uh, you know, straightforward. It can become this sort of advertisement for the ethos 
um, those last two images of Joseph Boyes in one performance, as you know, but the performative aspect of it that comes through, uh, I think is really terrific. Very lastly, I have two final images, if only to say that the students typically in this identity systems class have to put up a presentation, have to put up a show uh, like this. Obviously, we're in Zoom world now, we, we're not doing that, but the physical presence of it, the sense of scale, I think uh, is important. It enables the students to see everything together at one time, to see the relationships between the components. Does it work as a full graphic language? Just interestingly, with this student, these were these last two examples were for the company uh, Symantec. Her logo is, which you see on the top of the gray plinth there, is a kind of an S. When she was presenting that originally, she said she called that the kind of shift lock concept. And ultimately, I said, that's such a great description of what's going on there that you need to put that in the language in your posters. So that became a kind of a campaign. So again, another example, but seeing all the work together is important. The guidelines are important to give a sense of an overview of the whole, how the whole system works. You know, so that's this this happens just so you all know that happens in 14 weeks this this particular class um, there's a few final notes there that you can. Um, that you can look at the main key thing here is is the sense with which giving the students the full sense with which a, a typographic identity becomes part of. You know, it, it becomes an operational reality in terms of when it's used professionally, that is ultimately it's handed over to someone else to use so you have to be able to tell them. You can do this with it or you can do this with it it has to have constants that can be repeated that project consistency it has to have variables to allow other people to play with it in two three four years time or whatever so this happens in 14 weeks but i would say probably the most important part of that is the first seven weeks where they're generating the form the second half of the term is uh is, is basically playing with it uh and uh, putting it implementing it in different ways but the creation of the form a resolved form, I should say, is the most important aspect of it. From there, you can you can go anywhere. So we are just about on time. Um, thank you for watching. I'm going to stop sharing now, and uh, maybe we've got enough time for Ty to give us a few a few questions. Simon, uh, thank you for a, a really amazing presentation. So obviously, some really um, well executed uh, outcomes from those from those projects and those courses. Um, there are several questions. Uh, well, obviously, we can't get to them all, but I, there's there's one in particular that that I want to to ask you, sure. and it relates to and it relates to obviously me as well. Um, and it and it's really about, um, you know, the the uh, what we find ourselves doing now and as as professors and how we're teaching our classes now and as opposed to what we were doing before. So, uh, so so my question to you is, how is teaching? How is your teaching your teaching process changed? Uh, pivoting from from teaching physically in the classroom to remote teaching, uh, and what is what have been the what is, what have been the biggest challenges that you've faced uh, during that, and and how have you and your students adapted to just teaching remotely as opposed to being physically in the classroom? It's it's a it's a great question. Obviously, it's a very relevant question. Um, I I think we're 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 fortunate in in design and it's certainly in graphic design that we're, we're dealing we're still dealing with two dimensional surfaces. Uh, we can see someone's. A student's work on the on the screen we can still you know ask about this detail and that detail i feel sorry for the guys in product design and environmental design that don't yeah. have that uh yeah. so on, yeah. the one hand, on the one hand we're lucky that we can get get through this um at the same time it's difficult i mentioned in the presentation about the importance of really feeling scale of how right. when you're when you're walking right. those large posters you actually experience right. the presence of right a brand or a new identity at larger scale, and then it becomes real in a way that it isn't when it's on screen or on your phone, mm -hmm. it's real in a different way. And so I miss that. We haven't been able to put presentations together like I showed you in the last two slides with all the work together. Right. Do, do people still say slides? Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> did I date myself? I think I did. Um, um, so we, I miss that sense of presence. Obviously I miss, the sense of community with the, with the students being able to kind of laugh and joke and have some fun in, in, the, in the same room but at the same time we can at least get get things done um it's as you know it's uh it's there is such a thing as zoom fatigue um yeah. zoom fatigue is yeah, real yeah. and um uh you know as you know um and as many of our observers will know um you know teaching is giving um, it's, 
reaching inside yourself to find ways to articulate your knowledge and experiences and try and find a way to, to get that knowledge over to the students in a way that's interesting and um, provocative and but that sticks with them um, but it's 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 sometimes hard um, you know I, I I remember you know I used to come home from teaching in physical classrooms and sometimes be be exhausted uh, and, and mention that to my wife and and um, the same is true after zoom classes um, you know it it you feel like you're ready for a bit part in a zombie movie uh right at the end of a long zoom session sometimes but she sure. um, she's reminded me that um when i do get a little bit sort of down let's say and it doesn't happen very often but when it has happened she's reminded me of a, a very nice quote from from uh joseph boys who we saw in a couple of those um images earlier mm -hmm. um the artist joseph boys he said um he said um my best work of art is my students uh, and I've, I've always really loved that. Yeah. It's made me yeah. feel good to be a teacher. It's made me feel good to be about, you know, learn. I learn as much as you know. I, I learn from students as well as as well as you do. Um, mm -hmm. They learn yeah. hopefully from us, but we also learn something from them. And they they, they keep us young with their ideas and, and uh, participation. So, but it is harder on Zoom. Um, you know, you can get into, we've, we've had some success with using that kind of, mural program where you can put things up and it's kind of yeah. like a wall and you can put notes on it and so forth yeah. um, uh, that's good but um can this be over soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i miss the ahead. walls i miss the room yeah. i miss the students yeah uh just really quickly i mean i, I just wanted to say this before Gloria's gonna gonna cut us off right here in a minute. The, the thing that, especially for me, especially uh, spending a lot of time uh, in, in some of my classes talking about spatial graphics uh, and seeing things at large scale. I mean, none of our, our students aren't seeing typography when it hits a substrate like a, like a piece of paper or a building or metal or wood or anything like that. So that experience and that, that skill set that they should be getting is, is, like you said, I mean, in product design students, they're, you know, I feel sorry for them because they're not having that experience of, of being in the, uh, on, uh, on campus using the machines. So I feel like for, for us, the same thing, without students being able to see typography on paper, I mean, they could, we could force them into printing things out and putting them up at home to take a look at what the typography looks like when it hits a substrate, as opposed to seeing everything just on the screen is a huge difference as you know and I, I think that that we need to focus on that obviously right yeah and i think i think the key point here is the fact that um you know uh, a piece of sculpture a physical book um a pot yeah yeah they have presence we experience yeah. that presence uh yeah. it, it's important nothing on the screen can ever have presence right ever. <laughs> Um, so now you can't get around that. Um, and so that's that essence of presence. Sorry, I didn't mean to say oh. that. Uh, you know what I mean? Essence un of presence. Un 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 <laughs> scrap that, wipe that off the edit. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an important quality of seeing things in print, as you say, seeing type right. of size, um, right. even if they're doing something that's on screen, you know, I'm encouraging them print it out on your little laser, just have a look at it, real size. The only reality oh. of typography is the actual size. But it is hard. We don't have materiality to play with as part of our skill set. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, uh, it's an important part of who we are as designers and people, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thanks for answering that, Simon. Listen. Um, so we have other questions, which we'll get to in the in the breakout session. Uh, sure. Simon Agrin, really beautiful, beautifully executed work, and thank you so much for the presentation. Well, thank you to the students whose work it is. Obviously, uh, couldn't have happened without them. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Simon. Thank Thanks you, Ty. Uh, different Zoom. Bye. So everyone, thank you, guys. thank you for attending. See you guys in the classroom session. Thanks, Peace. everyone.